Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series, Maximizing Lifelong Brain Health in MS. Today's topic is MS Research Updates. This presentation features Dr. Enrique Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is the Clinic Director at the Rocky Mountain MS Center at the University of Colorado. He is a graduate of the Medical Scientist Training Program at the University of Colorado Denver and completed his Neurology Residency and Neuroimmunology Fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. He joined the Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Center at University of Colorado in 2013 and brings various MS experience and, along with other neurological disorders. This webinar is scheduled for one hour. The first 45 minutes will be a presentation from Dr. Enrique Alvarez. If you missed something on a slide, we will be archiving this webinar on our website, www.mscenter.org, so you can replay it at any time. We'll reserve approximately 15 minutes at the end to answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation by typing them into the chat window on your screen at any time. We will answer as many questions as time allows. With that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Alvarez. All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation to do uh, today's seminar. Um, we'll be kind of talking about a variety of uh, different topics that have been recently kind of released um, throughout the last uh, approximately year between a couple of the different big conferences, uh, the American Academy of Neurology and the big European MS meeting or ECTRAMS. Um, just because a lot of it will be kind of pharma um, or drug company um, sponsor type things, I just wanted to put my disclosure so you can see those there. And the topics I kind of split up were related to diagnosis, uh, we'll talk a little bit about relapsing MS, a little bit about progressive MS, remyelinating therapies, and then um, finish off a little bit on some symptom management. So just real briefly, kind of on the diagnosis end of things, I think this is something that a lot of times we kind of take for granted, uh, but it's impressive how long sometimes it takes uh, some patients to get diagnosed, um, and the fact that um, there's always concerns that some patients who get diagnosed with MS end up getting misdiagnosed and don't actually end up having MS. And so I wanted to kind of touch base on, on some of these things. We don't have that great biomarker yet for MS. We're incorporating MRI. Uh, we can do spinal tasks. We can do visually evoked potentials to kind of help make that diagnosis. But even with that, sometimes um, we can see that patients, uh, when they end up seeing a, a neurologist who specializes in the care of MS, end up thinking that the patient was misdiagnosed and don't actually have MS. So this is a study that was led by um, Andy Solomon at the University of Vermont, and uh, he looked at 110 patients at four MS centers um, that, that were misdiagnosed in the opinion of, of the docs at those centers. And they were kind of defined as 46% that they thought were definite and 54% who uh, were probably misdiagnosed. And it's kind of impressive sometimes what patients get treated with. Uh, so 70% of these patients were treated with MS. And, it, and it's important to kind of note that sometimes, you know, some of these, side of, you know, some of these drugs have side effects. 13% uh, of patients were treated with natalizumab or tisabri. Um, I think most of the people listening in are aware of the, the risk of PML with Tisabri. 2% of people got treated with mitoxantrum, which is a pretty hefty chemo. 1% were cyclophosphamide or cetoxin, which is, again, pretty hefty chemo. Um, and so they, they have their own set of side effects and, and kind of impressive um, about some of the, the issues um, and some of the consequences, I think, that this kind of demonstrates. 4% of the people had even participated in studies that looked at drug treatments with MS therapy. This is, I think, important because if you end up including a lot of patients in a study that don't have MS and you don't have much of an effect on how those patients are doing, well, the, the drug study is going to have its own issues. And I think that as we talk about drug studies, I think that becomes an important thing to kind of keep in the back of our mind. So what did these patients have? So 21% of patients had migraines. We know that migraines can give you a lot of little white spots on an MRI. And so this, this becomes a, a, a common issue um, um, with patients that we see that, that have a concern for, for MS. Migraines are more than just headaches. A lot of times they can have auras that can give you a lot of symptoms uh, associated with them, and so they can give you a lot of visual issues, a lot of room spinning or vertigo type of symptoms that, um, that can give you symptoms that look like MS. 
50% uh, have fibromyalgia, 12% uh, just had sort of funky looking MRIs, 11% uh, were psychogenic or having sort of underlying anxiety, depression disorders that, uh, that could kind of give you a lot of symptoms associated with that as well, and a host of other things. Um, so with that in mind, so what are some of the things that are kind of at the forefront to kind of help us diagnose MS? So one of the things um, <coughs> is looking at the central uh, vessel sign. MS lesions tend to be ovoid and kind of point away from these uh, areas in here that are filled with spinal fluid or the ventricles. That's the, the term of periventricular lesions. Um, and the reason for that might be is because there's little vessels that kind of drain into these ventricles. And so lesions tend to kind of track along those vessels. And so when you look at these little white spots of MS, there tends to be a little vessel in the middle of them. And sometimes you can kind of see it tracking along, especially with these ovoid lesions. Versus in patients who don't have MS and are probably having little white spots that resemble, that they are coming a little bit more from migraines, you can see spots that don't necessarily have that vessel associated with that. So this might be something in the future that we start looking at more. Uh, this sequence is not usually done, and so we might have to start incorporating that into our routine MRIs a little bit more. The other thing is to look um, at levels of proteins. Uh, traditionally, we've done a little bit of this in spinal fluid. Uh, some of you may have had spinal taps at the time of diagnosis. One of the proteins that, that we might be interested in looking at, for example, is as you look at nerve fibers uh, in the brain of this patient, um, they, uh, the nerve, so, um, the, these axons or these nerve fibers have a protein called neurofilament light. And as the cells break down, they release this protein, and you can look to see if there's uh, an increased amount of that protein. That can be useful, uh, but so far the levels could only really be reliably detected in spinal fluid, uh, but now with sort of a kind of a new and improved and more sensitive assay, we might be able to start picking up the levels of this protein in blood so we can maybe hopefully uh, try and avoid doing those spinal taps. This is still not available uh, clinically, it's a strictly a research tool, but just to kind of provide some of the information that might be useful. If we look at levels of this protein, it might help predict who goes on to develop the multiple sclerosis. So before anything becomes multiple, people need to have a single sclerosis. I guess that was too easy, so we have to call that CIS or clinically isolated syndrome. And so when people have clinically isolated syndromes and a blood draw associated with them, some percent of patients became MS and had another attack. Some patients stayed as a single attack. And it was surprising that at the original time of their blood draw that some of these patients that went on to MS had higher levels of this neurofilament light than patients who did not. These levels of uh, the protein correlate or basically kind of go hand in hand with sort of the effects that we see on brain volume. Uh, if you've listened to our webinars in the past or some of our education seminars, um, we've emphasized sort of the brain volume changes a lot as far as correlations with disability. Uh, in other words, um, the more brain volume you lose, the more concerned for increasing levels of disability. And so what this is kind of showing is depending, and there's different ways to kind of look at this. So the top panels are at 12 months, uh, the bottom panels are 60 months, and there are different ways of looking at brain volume. But I think it's clear that the trend throughout all this is that as as uh, brain volume changes decrease, that the levels of the protein decrease as well. Um, so that the proteins, the higher the levels, it's probably going to signify there's going to be more brain shrinkage when you look at that down the line. And so that's always a concern, and we can kind of maybe predict a little bit that for patients saying, oh, it looks like there was a lot of nerve damage associated with this attack, uh, or things like that. Other things that help us predict disability, um, you know, and just to kind of uh, help emphasize this issue of brain volume, uh, was some data that came out from um, uh, studies that were extension studies from the drug Gelenia or Fingolimod. Uh, when we looked at the time to reach EDSS of four, um, so sort of a mild to moderate level of disability at two years, patients who had changes in brain volume had a 67% increased risk of having more disability. We spend a lot of time talking about lesion volumes, but if you had lesions versus those that did not have lesions, 
that only went up 52% compared to that 67% for brain volume. Again, really emphasizing the role of brain volume over uh, lesions in looking at this. When we looked at EDSS of six, which is, a, again, EDSS is a disability measure. The EDSS of six translates into needing a cane to walk, so that becomes a common marker benchmark in a lot of studies because it's easy to find out if a patient's using a cane or not. Um, we could see that brain volume changes at 24 months had a 134% increase for those people who had more brain volume loss than those that did not. Again, brain volume is telling us a lot about the chances that you're going to have more disability down the line. The big challenge with brain volume is how do we measure that clinically, and that's a, an issue that we're still working on and very hard. So a lot of drugs are trying to kind of say, hey, we have an effect on brain volume. Uh, this is uh, some kind of similar long-term extension data with another oral drug, or Tecfidera, showing that patients who were initially treated with placebo and then switched over for two years and then switched over to Tecfidera or DMF on these slides, compared to patients who started on Tecfidera and went on to Tecfidera, that these patients had less brain volume change compared to those that started on the placebo. If we take those patients and kind of say, okay, we're going to play fair, and after the two years after the placebo and drug time, and then kind of look thereafter to see what the changes in brain volume are, we can see that there's even a long-term lasting effect of having been placed on placebo, as those patients on placebo had a, a higher level of brain loss compared to patients who initially got treated on Tecfidera. And this is four years out after a two-year treatment with Tecfidera again. So brain volume is giving us a lot of information, we think, and now the question is going to be how do we use that in clinic again. So how do we prevent some of the disability, some of the effects from MS? So there's a lot of things about sort of relapsing MS. And I'm going to take two steps and just kind of review maybe some positive data. We have a lot of options to treat MS. Uh, hopefully this graph shows it and demonstrates it, that we can find, I'm pretty sure, a drug for anybody, um, especially for relapsing MS. We have them that are injectable, that are infusion therapies, that are oral. You can see especially that even though they only had started getting drugs in 1993, that over the last five, six years, we continue to get a ton of new drugs out there. Uh, this past year, we had another drug. We had one the year before that in the generic form of a prior drug. The year before that, we had sort of, um, again, three drugs that came out. With that being said, we will probably get ocreluzumab approved by the end of the year, uh, probably later on this month. And so, again, from a relapsing perspective, we, I think we can say that we have you covered. One of the things to present a little philosophy about how we treat MS at our center, and just really briefly, if you look at number of attacks over time, these change. So after you get diagnosed, the number of attacks goes down. If you look at it by age of the patient, you can see that patients in their mid-30s and 40s have more attacks than patients that they get later on in life. So do we need to be as aggressive here as maybe here? Probably yes. And then maybe here we can back off a little bit. When we look at this and we try to adjust for treatment, pregnancy, and disease duration, years after being diagnosed, you can see that there's a steady decline in the number of attacks. And especially when you account for genders, you can see that we can kind of balance this. The point that I want to try and bring in is that if you look at how we treat most things in medicine, where you start off with mild drugs, and if that doesn't cover you, then you escalate to something else and you do this escalation therapy approach, you can see that we start with mild uh, uh, drugs as far as their eff effectiveness at a time when they have a higher chance of having attacks, and by the end, you end up on the higher efficacy drugs when you really don't need to be on those higher efficacy drugs. The approach that we like to think about is trying to hit it hard early and then maybe trying to back off, including maybe stopping therapy at some point, when the chances of having an attack are maybe 0.1, meaning you have to go every 10 years or treat 10 patients to try to prevent one attack. 
So I think it's important to try and match the disease severity with the drugs that you're using. So with the drugs that we have, I think there's some information about um, how to use these drugs that's useful, that, that's come out over the last couple of years. Some of this has been our own research. Um, so a lot of times we were able to do sort of chart review studies. Um, I'm going to thank um, Brandy Vollmer, who's done a lot of this work. Uh, comparing two drugs that probably will not get evaluated ever on a randomized controlled trial, just because the effects don't seem to be that different between them. Uh, but we were able to look at close to 700 patients just from our clinic to kind of be able to compare these two drugs. And what we can see and what we looked at was trying to see how many patients ended up on drug at the end of 24 months or two years. And we see that there was a difference that on Tecfidera or dimethylfumarate, really only 53% of patients ended up on drug at the end of two years versus 45, or sorry, excuse me, 65% on Gelenia. Most of this seems to be driven by adverse events or issues with tolerability. Um, disease activity we didn't see too much and we're still trying to explore this further. This was kind of borne out a little bit when we look at big insurance data claims. When they look at sort of relapse rates and they don't get quite as much detailed information as we are to look at sort of MRI data and things like this uh, when you have access to the individual charts. But when you look at interferon, copaxone, and teraflunamide, the blue represents before drug, the orange red represents after drug, there's not much difference in those drugs. Teraflunamide, by the way, is Abagio. When we look at Tecfidera, they saw that there was a decrease in the number of attacks. When you look at Gelenia or Fingolimod, there was again a decrease in relapse. So again, these drugs are having an effect, <coughs> and the question is how different are they? And that's the question that we were trying to look at. And they look, again, fairly similar using this kind of data. When we look at why patients dropped out, we can see that, for the most part, with Tecfidera, it tends to be a lot of GI issues and flushing. On the Fingolimod side, it tends to be more issues with sort of low white counts and uh, a little bit with infections, headaches, uh, and liver issues associated with it. I'm going to bring a little bit more attention to the white count issue, so this lymphopenia. Uh, there's different types of white counts, uh, including lymphocytes. Uh, when we look at the lymphopenia caused by Tecfidera, which tends to be anywhere from 6% or a persistent lymphopenia of maybe 2% over time, we can see that age probably matters. The green bars represent younger patients, the blue bars represent older patients over 55 or she's less than 35, and you can see that the older patients have their white counts lower than the younger patients. But why is this important? Because so far, two out of the four cases of, of PFL or the brain infection in uh, patients treated with Tecfidera had low lymphocyte counts. Age is also an important factor in the risk of, of PML if we look at it separately. So, so far, the youngest patient represented by these four patients who've had uh, PML, the youngest patient was about 55 um, who developed PML. Um, so we don't really see the, PM, uh, the PML cases in younger patients. So again, that tells us a little bit about how to use the old drugs, uh, present a little bit of information about the new drugs. So I mentioned eclizumab or Zimbrida got um, released this past uh, year. This is a drug that's an antibody, uh, similar to Tisabri or Rituximab, which we use uh, a fair amount at our center. And this drug basically takes this receptor which uh, usually signals IL-2. So IL-2 binds here and sends a signal inside the cell. I, uh, the declizumab basically removes what they call the high affinity receptor, or this alpha subunit. So instead of getting a really robust signal, you just get a smaller signal. So signal is still able to make it through here, but not quite um, as strongly. And the effect in MS was significant. Uh, we saw that the number of relapses got decreased by basically 50%. These are two different doses compared to placebo, and about 45% when you compare it against Avonex. When we look at MRI outcomes, the number of new contrast-enhancing lesions was lower compared to placebo. When you look at the number of new T2 lesions, again, these were lower than placebo. And you can see, you know, big significant effects of about 70 to 80%. One of the issues with the clizumab, though, is the side effects. Um, 
So overall, not too different, but the big concern are for these cutaneous events or skin events um, with on Avonex seeing 19% versus 37% for any cutaneous event or skin issue. Um, also maybe with a little bit more issues concerning with liver and particularly with, ish, uh, with uh, patients whose some of their enzyme levels went up to greater than five times upper limit of normal. That's what that ULN stands for. Uh, so this is a concern, and it, when the drug kind of came out um, for evaluation, uh, it does require liver monitoring every month, which is a little bit of a concern in trying to make this sort of a long-term viable treatment for a lot of our patients. The other concern is from the skin perspective, we're still having to understand this better. Um, we didn't know much, and when you ask a neurologist to evaluate skin, um, you end up with basically a big long mess. Um, so not so much that this is something I want you to read or memorize or anything else like this, but the problem is that all these skin things got labeled as something different. In reality though, we're seeing something that is probably fairly consistent across um, most patients. Uh, but we just need to understand that a little bit better. And so sometimes we're having to work with our dermatology colleagues to kind of understand this better. Ocrelizumab is similar to rituximab. The OPERA studies were presented earlier, and again, we should be getting uh, possibly approval of this medication by the end of the month. But with some of the data that got presented more, more recently in the last year was how many uh, of the patients had no evidence of disease activity. So we're not trying to kind of prevent relapses anymore. We're trying to make sure that the MRI stays stable, that we don't see any new lesions, that we don't see any contrast-enhancing lesions and all these things. And so in one study compared to the other study, in OPERA 1 versus 2, where they were compared to uh, Avonex, um, or sorry, Rebif, what we saw is that only about 29% of patients met this threshold of NIDA, compared to 48%, 47%, pretty consistently across the two studies. Um, so this is a big change. Um, and we can see that now we can probably keep about 50% of the patients really clinically stable with no evidence of disease activity. One of the issues sometimes is there's a little bit of a lag between sort of when the drugs get started and when you look at T2 lesions that don't enhance. And so if we really reset with the first MRI on drug, we can see that we can impact this NIDA part to 96% of patients treated with ocrelizumab, meaning 96% of patients over the length of the last 18 months on this study really had no relapses, no progression on disability, no active lesions, and no new T2 lesions compared to that scan that was reset for them. And this number was very consistent between the two studies. So again, when I say that we probably have a drug that we can keep you stable on, I'm really meaning for relapsing MS that we can probably keep you pretty stable. We get a lot of questions about stem cells, so this was a meta-analysis. They take a bunch of different studies. They took 15 in this case that included 764 patients that were done over the last basically 10 years to try and see how they did. Part of the problem with this is that autologous stem cell transplants have an issue about once you wipe out um, your immune, your, basically your immune system to get the new immune system in there, is there, there's a few patients that die from that. And this was about 2.1%. For a disease that we can kind of control well, this is a number that concerns me because we did not necessarily have 2.1% of our patients die when we treated with ocrelizumab. You can see though that it does decrease the number of attacks and one of the questions that's come up is how much of this was the stem cells versus how much of this was the chemo used to wipe out the immune system to get the transplant to take over. So these are, I think, a lot of questions that remain around stem cells, at least in my mind. When we look at progressive disease, there's been a number of studies that have come up on this topic. Uh, Oratoria is the ocrelizumab study, and we can again see <coughs> that there was an effect in reducing disability. The new data that came out was looking at patients that had contrast-enhancing lesions versus those that did not. When you split the group, the numbers got smaller, and so we stopped seeing uh, an effect um, in each individual group to kind of say which of these groups was driving that decrease. Uh, 
But basically, again, over the overall study, we saw a reduction of 24% in the level of disability in these patients. In other words, I should rephrase that. 24% more stable, more patients stayed stable without any increase in disability with the treatment of ocrelizumab. The effects were seen on MRI. So we could see that the patients treated with ocrelizumab had less brain shrinkage. And again, patients who either had contrast-enhancing lesions or no contrast-enhancing lesions, both of these had fewer, uh, less of the brain shrinkage or less brain atrophy associated with that. Uh, about last year, but published this past year, we saw uh, the results of Jelenia in primary progressive MS. And you can see that the two curves really over, you know, overlap each other very well. So Jelenia did not have much of an effect in primary progressive MS um, when we look at this study. So it's curious that when we look at siponimod, which is sort of a more selective uh, Jelen version of Jelenia, that we did see an effect. And we heard results from the EXPAND study, which was a phase three study, one of the bigger kind of studies that we need to get the drugs approved, in secondary progressive MS. Things I would highlight, the main thing from this study is these patients were very well studied. The baseline characteristics were very similar between the studies. They had a fair number of MRIs and things like this. In the uh, ocrelizumab studies, the patient cutoff was 55. These patients included patients that were a little bit older, went up to 60. The EDSS cutoffs were a little bit older. This went up to 6.5. I think the cutoff for the uh, or, uh, Ocrelizumab studies was either 5.5 or 6.0. Uh, it was initially 6.0, but then they moved it down to 5.5. That we still managed to see now an effect in reducing uh, the risk of patients who had worsening of disability. Number's not big. The graphic probably doesn't do justice to it. Um, but a 21% reduction is not that far off from the 24% reduction that we saw with ocrelizumab. We saw sort of a 26% reduction at six month confirmed disability progression as opposed to three months, so very consistently that way. We saw consistent effects on number of attacks, so the annualized relapse rate, the number of new T2 lesions, the T2 lesion volume, brain volume. Uh, we did not see an effect on 25 foot time walk, but we saw a lot of ch uh, changes heading the right direction across a lot of the different outcomes of that study. Um, so again, a little bit hard to interpret given the prior experience with Jelenia, but this looks promising and it might signify that we will probably soon have a couple different drugs approved for progressive forms of MS. The number of side effects associated with uh, siponimod were not that different from placebo, and you can see a large number of different things I got looked at, uh, but again, very similar between placebo and siponimod. We got results of Tisabri and secondary progressive MS. Um, the overall uh, endpoint for the study was a composite of something called nine-hole peg test that looks at hand function, how fast you walk, and 25-foot time walk, and then overall disability in the EDSS scale. If you met change criteria in any one of these three things, you met a composite endpoint, basically. Most of the headline results for this study was that the composite um, did not have a positive effect, meaning Tisabri did not have an effect in uh, secondary progressive MS. However, the way I look at it is it did look to have an effect on nine-hole peg test. And to me, this is important because usually this is affected a little bit later, meaning that if we treat patients with early secondary progressive, I think that we probably would have an effect on slowing down some of the progression that we can see in MS. However, things are a little bit more advanced, which is usually involving the legs earlier, so it's more disabled by the time they would enter the study, don't quite have any effect, and pretty much there's no difference between the placebo and the drug. A lot of questions that we get are related to biotin. Um, so you can see here they really blew up the age. They included primary progressive, secondary progressive. The EDSSs are higher, so seven. Seven EDSS means wheel uh, walker, sorry. Um, and they look at progression in the EDSS over the last two years. Um, when we look at this study, it did meet its endpoint, uh, but it was driven by a very small number of patients. So when we look at the biotin, only 13 out of the 103 patients had an improvement, which was about 12% of the patients or 13% of the patients if you round up. 
uh, compared to none in the placebo group. So this was being driven by a very small number of patients uh, in this study. Uh, you can see, you know, when you have few patients, you can look at them. A lot of them were males, um, mostly secondary progressives uh, over primary progressive patients, um, but they had had uh, MS for a fair number of years. Um, they had a fair amount of disability, um, and you can see that they tended to improve on sort of overall disability or 25-foot time walk for the most part, but hardly ever in both categories. But one of the things that was interesting, again, this is the 13 patients on drug versus none in the other study, was then they took all of these placebo patients and gave them biotin. And then you started to see some improvement in those placebo patients who got switched over to biotin. This is sort of improvement at 18 months that was confirmed at 24 months, or just patients who had improvement at 24 months. And you had a couple percent of patients who were in the original study who now started to kind of improve. So again, suggesting that maybe there is something to this biotin study However, driven by a small number of patients, and we definitely need larger studies which are currently underway. A couple of quick other slides related to this is uh, a studies on statins. Uh, so in this case, they use simvastatin, pretty decent dose. Uh, so again, not without sort of their own set of side effects. And this is kind of a busy slide, but basically you can see that each dot's one patient, so not a huge number of patients. Uh, but that the overall change in brain volume uh, was at 12 months a little bit, uh, so there was less atrophy or brain shrinkage in the patients treated with uh, the, the simvastatin. Um, same thing at 12 to 25 months or even at 25 months. Uh, when you looked at sort of a composite score of dis uh, disability in the MSFC, um, these patients did better. Um, with less progression. Uh, MSIS is a patient reported outcome or PRO and these patients were overall again had less change in their scores than the patients who got uh, on just placebo. So overall again having sort of a small pilot data to kind of say hey this might be a viable option. Um, you do have to monitor for liver and muscle damage associated with these drugs so again it's, it's something that you have to weigh a little bit for each person there was another kind of smaller study done from the University of Oregon looking at something called ethylipoic acid. This is an oral antioxidant that you can buy over the counter. And they looked at a two-year study. Uh, patients were, were randomized to a sugar pill. And again, small patients, 24 and 27 patients, but they look fairly much like most of our progressive patients. They didn't really see any outcomes that changed except for brain volume changes. Um, again. Um, they went from a change of losing 0.65% of their brain volume per year to only 0.22%. Um, so again, a significant reduction in how much brain volume you're losing. The problem with this was there's a few of these patients that had GI upsets and falls, so just because it's over the counter doesn't necessarily mean that it's necessarily safe and well tolerated and you always have some of these issues that kind of can pop up from it. So let me look a little bit at remyelinating therapies, and I'm kind of finishing off here pretty soon. We'll start some questions in a little bit. Uh, but with these remyelinating therapies, the one that we heard a little bit more about was the anti-lingo uh, therapy. Uh, this is an auto, uh, not, not an auto antibody, excuse me, uh, but just an antibody that targets a protein called lingo-1. Lingo-1 is kind of a stop signal. So basically, as you have sort of immature uh, oligodendrocytes, this is a cell that's in the brain and kind of helps insulate some of the nerves and makes signals go faster and helps support uh, some of the cells and some of the cells that are damaged in MS. Antilingo keeps those cells at this stage. Antilingo then would prevent that stop and allow cells to get mature so that they can help support those nerve cells. When we look at this, they looked at it in patients who had an optic neuritis or damage to their optic nerve, uh, the nerve that carries information from the eye to the brain. And what they saw is that the, there was maybe a slight improvement in the patients who got treated uh, versus not treated, uh, but this uh, effect was not statistically significant uh, and not much different. They saw a small effect in the eye that was not affected or what they call the fellow eye. Uh, 
And so again, it's a little bit hard to know why this is. Um, the study that I don't have any um, slides for was basically a study that looked at uh, MS. And again, that study was mainly considered negative that was presented at the ECTRAMS meeting. Um, so again, it uh, didn't look like this drug really had an effect on trying to prevent disability progression in MS patients with progressive forms of MS. Uh, so more information about that to come. There was a small study presented at uh, the American Academy of Neurology looking at clomastine. Uh, again, fairly small, not a big difference, but this is, again, one of these drugs that's uh, available over the counter. This is basically kind of a drug related to Benadryl. Um, so they took patients that had optic neuritis, and what they saw is that there was a little bit of an increase in how fast the signal made it back to the brain of the eye, suggesting that that optic nerve maybe got remyelinated uh, a little bit by clomastine. The problem is, is if you imagine if you're taking something like Benadryl, more of these patients on drug had more fatigue issues associated with that. Um, if you looked at sort of how did the patients feel like they saw and that kind of thing, and visual acuity, they may not see much of a difference. For symptom management, uh, there's tons of data that's coming out about this, you know, again, suggesting that exercise is important, that proper nutrition is important, uh, not maybe specifically any specific diets uh, and things like this, but I wanted to kind of present a little bit of a new drug that may come out for spasticity called Arbaclofen. Basically, this drug gets converted over to, um, it's kind of like an extended formulation and it becomes a pro-drug for Baclofen, meaning this gets metabolized or changed in our bodies to make Baclofen, which again, a lot of our patients are on. The nice thing about this is you can basically go from taking it four times a day to taking it two times a day. And so you don't get quite the highs um, or the lows, but you get kind of a little bit of a smoother level of the drug in your body. It was titrated, meaning they kind of raised the level of the drug gradually to kind of let the patients get used to it. Most of the patients on Baclofen will know how tired Baclofen can kind of make you feel, so this allows you to kind of tolerate the drug a little bit better. And we saw is that both drugs work really well on spasticity or that tightness that can sometimes occur in MS. But again, the purpose of this drug is not so much to try to improve this better than Baclofen was, it's just so you could tolerate it better. And we did see that the sleepiness, drowsiness, and dizziness associated with Baclofen were less in the Arbaclofen group than in the Baclofen group. And it was honestly just a little bit more convenient to take. So with that, I basically will turn it over and kind of get around to any questions that the audience may have. And you can continue to submit your questions through the chat window on your screen. Um, we'll go ahead and start it off and ask uh, one of the pre-submitted uh, questions. Are there any risks in receiving an injected flu vaccine while on to Sabri? Uh, not, uh, so there's no risk at all to getting the flu vaccine. Uh, whether on um, whatever drug you're at. We get a little bit nervous about um, getting a vaccine for live viruses versus dead viruses. Uh, so the concern might be a little bit with like flu mist, which is the uh, intranasal uh, flu vaccine. Um, it was getting really popular a few years ago, especially with kids, uh, but we're not really seeing a lot of use of that, and it's usually not commonly seen in, in adults anymore. So the shot, again, is a dead vaccine and very safe to use with any of our drugs. Um, are there research programs addressing secondary progressive MS? How do you differentiate between secondary progressive and normal aging with MS in older patients? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, I think we show that uh, there's definitely a lot of um, studies being looked at looking at secondary progressive MS. Um, secondary progressive MS is something that um, is always a little bit difficult to study. Um, you know, that Saponimod study, for example, was a really nicely done study. And why it's a little bit more complicated is because you're dealing with relapses and you're dealing with progression and you're trying to have to sort out, you know, how much of the disability might be, or prog you know, progression of disability is related to relapses versus with progression. Uh, and what part of those things are you having an effect on? 
Uh, so you have to kind of tease those differences out a little bit to, uh, to try and make some sense out of it. So if we concentrate on the progressive part of the secondary progressive MS and trying to figure out how much or how similar that is to normal aging, um, you know, <clears throat> that, that becomes again another issue because we honestly sometimes in some of these measures don't have a ton of information about what normal aging really should be, right? When you talk to a geriatric doc or the docs that take care of older patients, Aging is not a disease and things shouldn't get worse with aging, although we tend to kind of recognize that sometimes. Anyway, the difficult part is sometimes when we can try to sort that out, and there's a couple of efforts at our university, is to try and look at brain shrinkage and trying to kind of say, if you appear to be stable and MS um, with your MS drug, um, is that shrinkage of the brain matching the shrinkage that we might expect for aging. Um, and so those are important questions that we're working on trying to figure out. Um, and you know, at the individual level, just uh, it's tough. Um, is it um, memory issues and making sure it's not uh, superimposed Alzheimer's or things like this? Um, is it you know, just because you're not sleeping well at night and so you're getting worse? Uh, but it's because you're having spasms that keeps you up at night, and so having to work on those spasms so that you can sleep through the night and make sure you can think well the following morning. Um, and so those, uh, that's, the, that's the big challenge and something that I think we still need to work on uh, a lot more. Uh, what can you tell us about the supplementation of vitamin D, among others, in treatment of the disease? the vitamin D question. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, vitamin D is kind of an interesting vitamin um, because it's a vitamin that um, instead of most of the other things that we have as vitamins where we eat it, most of the vitamin D that we make is actually through sunlight. Um, if you really enjoy liver or you have uh, sort of a, a bear's uh, diet where you eat a lot of fatty fish and salmon or things like this or herring, uh, you can get a fair amount of vitamin D through your diet. I don't get a lot of patients who uh, do that. And so you end up kind of looking at getting vitamin D um, through basically uh, sunlight exposure. That's probably one of the reasons why white people are white is to allow more sunlight to reach our bodies to make that vitamin D. You can make a tremendous amount of vitamin D with sunlight exposure. So even though these numbers look big for us, we can see that, that we probably really, you know, 5,000 units a day, for example, is a good starting point when I look at, uh, at our patients. But just to kind of provide it as a reference mark, um, about, uh, so most, if you look at people who are, of, you know, if you kind of call them aboriginal people that kind of tend to live mostly outdoors, don't, you know, wear kind of more primitive clothing, you know, tribes, people in Africa, South America, things like this, their vitamin D levels are on average are about 45 or 50. When we look at our reference range at the university, which is one of my pet peeves, um, the reference range goes all the way down to 16, uh, and I think goes up to about 46. The problem with that is that we know that we need to do a level of about 30 in order for bone health metabolism um, and trying to prevent bone thinning and things like that. And so the issue is, is we probably need to be getting up into those levels really to be sort of normal range and being a level of 16, even though that's okay because that's what most people are at, it just tell us that everybody that we're looking at is probably low on vitamin D to begin with. And so a level of about 5,000 or 10,000 seems to be about the range that we need for most patients to get into that range of about 45 or 50. Uh, what sort of updates do we have on biomarkers and prognostic indicators of disease course? Yeah, so we touched base a little bit on that uh, with some of the slides. So um, I think a lot of the, uh, the, you know, sometimes biomarkers we tend to kind of specialize mostly in blood or spinal fluid proteins or things like that. I think we use MRIs a lot. 
Um, and so I think our best biomarker still is MRI endpoints about brain volume, number of T2 lesions, uh, things like this. I think one of our biggest biomarkers uh, really for the treatment of MS is age. Uh, so it's simple demographic data, um, how old or young are you. Um, the younger patients, as we showed, really tend to have a lot more attacks. Um, and so we probably need to be a little bit more aggressive early for some of that, uh, some, of, some, of, some of those things. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about sort of the effect of brain volume um, uh, as a pro uh, prognostic indicator for disability. I think the really the new one that we're really getting kind of excited about is actually getting some stuff in blood that we can actually start to measure. And that's where that serum neurofilament light uh, that I talked about earlier, I think, really uh, has a lot of promise. Uh, are you considered stable if you have brain atrophy but no other negative effects, for example, no new lesions or active lesions? Uh, that's a tricky question mostly because we all have brain atrophy. Um, so all of our brains start to shrink after we hit about 35 or thereabouts. And the question is, do you have more atrophy than the average bear um, and, and, and those kinds of things? If, if the level of atrophy per year is higher than what we would kind of expect for uh, somebody who doesn't have MS, then no, I would not consider that to be stable. The problem that's happening a little bit with trying to measure brain volume is, a, is twofold. One is how do you measure that in clinic and what kind of programs are doing that? Uh, the program that we're using at the university is really only about a year, maybe two years old as far as how long it's been on the market. We're spending a lot of time and effort right now trying to figure out is it working our MRIs, what, what uh, atrophy is considered to be normal aging, um, what what part of the brain should we look at? Should we look at the whole brain? Should we look at specific parts of the brain? And so even though we have this kind of information about whole brain, trying to implement it in practice is becoming a little bit of a challenge, um, just as we need to kind of gain a little bit more experience in using it. The other part of the problem, and the second part, is that um, our brains shrink and expand on a daily basis. So uh, when we wake up, we have big brains as we get throughout the day and we dehydrate a little bit, our brains tend to shrink. And the problem is that that tends to happen on a rate similar to what we see our brains shrink on a year-to-year -year basis. So do we need to institute protocols for hydrating before every MRI? Do we need to do them at the same time of the day all the time and those kinds of things? Um, and so those are the things that we're still kind of trying to explore as well uh, so that we can use a little bit more consistently in people. Right now I would say it's a better biomarker or a better indication as a population. So if you had 100 people like you, I can kind of say that if you had this level of atrophy, that would be really bad, or this might be really good. The cutoff that we're using right now is about 0.4% change per year. That's a really small change. Um, and so any little problem with sort of the way that we calculate brain volume can, can be an issue. Um, what do you foresee the role of induction therapies like well, to the mouth. <laughs> in proactively protecting brain loss and function as we get more positive da uh, data about outcomes? Yeah, so um, induction therapy is a concept that's been around for a long time, um, whether it's with alentuzumab or chemo drugs uh, and things like this. Um, it's you know, the long-term data on all these drugs are great. Um, I think the, the issue that we're still trying to figure out is what's the right in, induction um, or right issues as far as when does the effect wear out of some of these drugs? When should you stop using the induction? Uh, is it more of a de-escalation of therapy, for example? Um, there's no doubt that these really uh, great drugs are great as far as the effect that they have on brain. Um, but some patients um, will need something after alentuzumab, and that gets a little bit hard to monitor with alentuzumab as to when to know when to institute a second drug, what, what other drugs to switch you to afterwards, uh, and those kinds of things. And that's the challenge that we're having. One of the studies that we're looking at is when to stop drug, for example. Uh, and it'd be great to have some of these biomarkers
to kind of be able to say, it's like, oh, it looks like your inflammation level is starting to kind of come down, your disease activity is less. Now we can either de-escalate you, uh, so putting you on something that's maybe less aggressive. Some of that we also have to look at because I think we're starting to get drugs that, even though they might be more aggressive, may actually end up having less side effects than some of the drugs that are out there. And I think you have to weigh in a little bit of the side effects with how effective they are. Um, and so whether um, it's induction with alentuzumab, rituximab, chemo, tesabri, uh, those kinds of things, um, I think it's something that we definitely believe in. Uh, for patients who have very active MRIs, I routinely will put them on one of those really efficacious drugs and then reevaluate and kind of say, okay, your risk on this drug is fairly low, let's keep you on it, or this drug is pretty, uh, pretty risky in a sense, let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch you out to something else, um, maybe another uh, very efficacious drug or maybe something that's a little bit milder. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez, for sharing these research updates and your time with us today. Um, it's an exciting and optimistic time in MS. After we close the webinar, you will see a short survey. Please take a moment to let us know your thoughts. We do look over and evaluate all of the feedback that we receive. You can find additional MS education resources on our website at www.mscenter.org.